There's a famous American philosopher, William James, who, when he was a young man, had no idea of becoming a philosopher. He wanted to be an artist. But his father made it clear in no uncertain terms that this was not going to happen. After a long struggle with his father, he finally relented and then fell into a severe depression that lasted for many years. What got him out of that depression I was reading in the work of a French philosopher who raised the question, why believe in determinism when you could also believe in free will? Why believe in something that would place limitations on you? So the young James decided that his first act of free will would be to believe in free will. From there he went on to have a very successful career as a psychologist, philosopher. And in his philosophy he kept raising that question, the question of free will, in response to people who believed in determinism. He said, actually, there are two types of truths out there in the world. There are the truths of the observer, in other words, things that you Observe having to get your will out of the way, aside from the will to know. But there are certain things that you're not going to discover unless you realize that you can't let what you want get in the way. An example would be the discovery of the orbits of the planets. For a long time people wanted them to be circles, and they weren't circles. One found that Someone said, let's just look at what they are rather than what we want them to be. And they discovered that they were ellipses. As for truths of the will, the second kind of truth, within the realm of what is possible, there are certain things that will happen only if you want them. You become a good piano player only if you want to become a good piano player. You become a good scientist only if you want to become a good scientist. So in that realm of the truths of the will, you have to ask yourself, why would you believe or why would you want to believe in anything that would place unnecessary limitations on you? The Buddha himself raises this question in one of the suttas. He says it's possible to believe that there is such a thing as an action, and that actions do have results, or it's possible to believe that actions are not real, or they have no results. But if you believe that they're not real or they have no results, you're very unlikely to do skillful things, act in skillful ways. And you close off the possibility of learning how to benefit from skillful actions. So it's wiser to believe in the fact that there is action. Action is real, and your actions do have consequences. Similar, similarly with the belief in the cessation of becoming, which is a synonym for the cessation of suffering or for nibbana. If you don't believe that it's possible, you're not going to be doing anything to, to find it. But if you do believe it's possible, you're going to want to at least open that possibility. You're not placing a limitation on you. Make it a possibility that you could find the cessation of becoming, the cessation of suffering, nibbana. An implication the Buddha is making here is that you don't want to close off possibilities through your beliefs. So this raises the question. Why would you want not to believe in these things? Why would you not want to believe in the Four Noble Truths? That suffering is clinging. It's caused by your craving. It can be ended by ending the craving, and there is a path of practice to follow. This is a set of beliefs that offers hope. If you don't want to believe in it, why? 
Now you may have some history with beliefs, disappointed beliefs. or past disappointments in general, where you wanted something and you just got stymied. There's also the fear of unrewarded effort. What if it's not true? You put out the effort and it turns out to be effort in vain. Well, remember, nobody's ever proven the Buddha wrong on these points. And the prospects that are opened by these points are surely desirable. A total end of suffering that can be attained through your efforts. So if you find yourself defeated by past disappointments, why let yourself be defeated? Think of the young Buddha-to-be on his quest for awakening. He went down many false paths. The paths are some of the formless attainments. The path is self-torture. He put in a lot of effort each time, and each time he came up wanting. But he never let himself get discouraged. Each time he figured, I must be doing something wrong. What can I change in my actions? He never entertained the possibility that true happiness was not possible. He never let himself get discouraged. His desire for true happiness was that strong. Think of what he said about the secret to his awakening, the two secrets. One was an unwillingness to rest content with skillful qualities. And the other was relentless effort. In both those cases, it's a matter of the strength of his desire. He wouldn't let himself rest content, even with the very subtle pleasures of the formless attainments. As long as he saw it. As he saw that there was something conditioned there, he realized okay, this couldn't be the, the solution to the problem. So he kept on looking, looking. But it wasn't just strength of desire that got him through. It was also his discernment, his ingenuity, figuring out new ways of approaching the problem when the old ways hadn't worked. He finally came to realize that looking at the desire in and of itself, looking at the intention in and of itself, was going to be a large part of the solution. So he started paying attention to his intentions and was able to sort out what was skillful and what was not. We finally arrived at awakening. That attention to his intentions, he later taught us the quality of analysis of qualities, one of the factors for awakening. And it's precisely the factor that brings an end to doubt, an end to the unwillingness to believe that there is a way out. One of the other lessons he drew from all of this, of course, was that in finding the path and in discovering what was lying in the way of the path, desire played a big role. There were the desires that got in the way, and there was the desire that saw him through. This is why craving is one of the, listed as one of the causes of suffering, but the desire and right effort is part of the path out. As he said, all things, all phenomena are rooted in desire. Soon the question comes up, how much do you believe in your ability to gain awakening?
you have to look into that desire. And if you find the desire is weak or discouraged, you have to learn to talk to yourself. Ask yourself, what are the alternatives? Just continued suffering on and on and on. Do you want that? Why would you want anything less than an unconditioned happiness? There may be one voice in the mind that says, how can a conditioned path find an unconditioned happiness? But the way the book would have explained causality showed that through a complex process, in which some causes give rise to the results immediately, others take time. When you put those two principles together, you get a very complex process. And that complex process does allow for causes to lead to the threshold of something uncaused. So that, for the Buddha, is one of the truths of the observer. This is simply the way things are. This is the way causality works. And it does respond to skillful intentions and unskillful intentions. It's because this is one of his truths of the observer, and probably one of the most important ones. When he was asked to explain his awakening in the shortest terms, this was the answer he would give. So, given that these are the truths of the observer, the Buddha as observer, you have to ask yourself, what now are the truths of your will? What do you truly want? And if it's anything less than the very best, why? <laughs>